Hi, everybody. As mentioned, can you hear me okay? As mentioned, I'm Jason Brubaker. I run a website called filmmakingstuff.com, and so far I've produced four feature films. Uh, the topic of today's talk is how to sell your movie without the middleman. But for those of you who have never made a movie or a TV show and you're thinking about that, I'm also going to give you some tips on how to actually make your content without waiting around and asking permission. I think that one of my fundamental philosophies that I follow in life is <laughs> create the content you can create this year with the resources that you have now. And before we get too deep into it, I'd like to just acknowledge the fact that you're all out here on a beautiful uh, afternoon in Southern California. I'd also take a moment to acknowledge the fact that we have this great camera crew around. Uh, they've been working pretty hard all day, as well as Vaughn Johnson, the gentleman who put this together. Could we go ahead and give these guys a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you, Vaughn. So what, what you can expect with me is I'm going to, I'm going to cover uh, the difference between independent filmmaking and other businesses. I'm going to share with you my seven-step sell your movie now system, and we're going to find out the most important five questions you need to ask before you go into any production. Now, I will say that all of this is very biased. It's all based on my own experience. So it, what is right for me may not be particularly right for you. I just ask that you stay here with an open mind, and if there's something that you can use and apply to your own business, go ahead and run with it. Moving forward, here's a little bit about my story. Now, if I still had that haircut, do you think anybody would take me seriously? Uh, that was a decade ago. I was fresh out of college, and like a lot of young filmmakers, no other vocation appealed to me more than making movies. So unlike uh, moving to New York City or, or uh, Los Angeles, I started my career in York, Pennsylvania, which is my hometown. And this is a picture of me uh, serving a role as a dolly grip um, <laughs> on a smaller market 16 millimeter TV commercial. And I did a heck of a lot of these. In fact, I spent a year with these guys and I learned an awful lot about how to make productions efficiently. Now the funny thing about this is we were still shooting 16 millimeter. We also made a few of these in 35 millimeter, if you believe it. Um, Obviously, things have evolved a little bit, and I'll get to that in a second. But my biggest thing was, although it was great to make these TV commercials, I had always wanted to make features. And in making a feature, I thought, what do I need to do to take what I've learned making these commercials and go on and actually make feature films? And the question that kept coming to mind is money. How do I get the money to make my movie? So I left York, Pennsylvania, and I went to New York City, and I spent some time working with an independent producer up there. And in that short amount of time, I learned that there were some fundamental differences between filmmaking and other businesses. And the way that I learned that is I had the opportunity to go out on these meetings where we would meet with prospective investors and we would pitch our movie business. We'd say, hey, we got this great idea for a movie. We'd like you to invest in it. And of course, the, the response that always came back to us is that's great, guys. How will you return my investment? Now, I want to talk a little bit about the Sundance dream. And I don't want to diminish the dream, but I want to bring it up here. Back then, the only way that you could get your content out into the world that if you were so fortunate to find somebody to invest in your movie, your next step in the process would be to get into film festivals, cross your fingers that your movie would, A, even get into the film festivals, and if it did, cross your fingers that it would build buzz, and then build enough buzz so that an acquisitions executive would come along and give you some sort of return on investment in the form of an upfront cash advance. And then, if you were really, really, really lucky, you'd go on to make your three-picture deal. Now, again, this was the era of the 1990s, or the late 90s into the 2000s. I'm not that old yet. Um, and that was the Sundance dream back there. Unfortunately for a lot of filmmakers, that Sundance dream didn't really pay off. It became a Sundance nightmare because a lot of filmmakers, this was based on more of a lottery for a lot of filmmakers versus an actual business, which got me thinking, what is this difference between um, myself trying to produce movies and the people that were approaching these prospective investors who are oftentimes widget producers? So dear Mr. Widget Producer, will you invest in my money? Because clearly, we both have to come up with a blueprint. Now you've heard this before, a screenplay is the blueprint for your movie, right? And your content project. And for the widget producer, a blueprint is obviously the blueprint for their widget. 
The next stage is once we have an idea for what it is that we want to create, we have to go out and find the money. So that's the same. And finally, once we get the money, both of us have to establish a company. Now granted, if you're a widget producer, your company may be bricks and mortar. And our company as film and TV producers may be a little bit more mobile. We may take our companies and we may go to various locations, but the idea is the same. We put our cast and crew together, our workers, so that we can in the end come out with a product. And our product is obviously the finished feature film. And their product is obviously the widget, right? Everything seems pretty similar. So I don't understand why, what the big difference is. The next stage for both of us is to go out and distribute and sell our movies, right? Because you do this with the hope that your investment, the time and money that you invested in your product is going to bring you some money far greater than the actual investment that you made in the product. So while the widget producer already has this down to the science because in the widget producer's company, he already has a distribution strategy, a marketing team, and a sales team. Guess what? In the old business model that I don't particularly agree, in, agree with anymore, you used to, as a filmmaker, you would have to go out and find some middleman distributor to say, hey, by the way, I really like that movie that you put your blood, sweat, and tears into. We're going to acquire it. But you know, the funny thing is, is um, Oftentimes, these guys would give you something that, that you thought might be a deal. Hey, we'll get your movie into the shelves at the local video store. And you're like, okay, but how much does that pay? Well, nothing, but you'll be in the local video store. Now, it's kind of funny now because we all have seen what has happened in one of the biggest local video or the biggest video stores in, in the world. It's gone. Um, but back then, you couldn't even access that marketplace, even though that marketplace doesn't really exist anymore, without asking permission. And I hated that. Because what that meant for most filmmakers is, after you, you, you finally achieved your dream of making your movie, guess what? You got to go back to your day job. Meanwhile, that beautiful movie that you put everything into is now collecting dust. And you probably stare at it on your bookshelf with a lot of anger. And that's a pain in the butt. And that frustrated me. And it frustrated a lot of filmmakers. So the good news is, and I'm not here to be pessimistic, things are changing. All day long we've listened to these uh, wonderful speakers that tell us how the world is changing. And for independent content producers, for those of us that want to make our movies without asking permission, things have gotten awesomely better. What does this look like to you guys? <laughs> An HDSLR camera. These days, you can go down to your local electronic store and buy a camera that produces cinematic quality video. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to produce great cinema, but what it does mean is that we all now, for about $2,000, can go down and create something awesome. In addition to that, if you want it to look even better, you can do something like that and uh, put a big rig together, and suddenly your, your small camera looks affordable and awesome. The other thing that's changed significantly, and this is what I'm so happy about and why I'm such an evangelist of this new movement, is video on demand uh, as, and some of these internet outlets have become completely non-discriminatory, which means that any of you in here, if you create content, you can go out and find your audience without a middleman. There's nobody standing in between you and them, which now makes your market accessible, which as I mentioned, um, this guy's saying, I can get your movie on iTunes, and as you'll see in a few minutes, so can you. So you're like, so what? And the reason why I emphasize this uh, for you guys and anybody who's watching the video is, if you have a traditional distributor that comes up to you and says, I'm gonna get your movie on the iTunes, go ahead and give me your rights for seven years. And you say to that guy, okay, great, what's my upfront advance? Well, nothing. Okay, well, if the movie makes money on the back end, we'll give you something after we take our cut. My question to you is, what, what is the value here in going with any middleman to help you get somewhere you can get on your own? So this is the big question uh, that has fortunately changed my life for the better. But unfortunately, I'm not the only filmmaker in the world who knows this. In fact, everybody these days has a factory, which now means that we have an awful lot of competition. But the good news is, thanks to the internet, the playing field has leveled. Unfortunately, and, and this is something that may be a little bit hard um, to look at, the truth of the matter is, if we were still comparing 
modern movie making to widget factory production, what we are going through right now is in ways akin to what these widget producers experience when sweatshop factory labor overseas starts creating a widget of comparable value. In other words, the marketplace is flooded with cheaply produced, somewhat comparable goods. Now, I'm not saying these movies that are competing with the $100 movie, just for this example, are as good as a $100 movie, but guess what? If you're a person, you only have time to really find the one movie you're going to watch for that particular day. So now you have all this competition, and, you, and, these, uh, and your audience has to weed through the competition. Okay, so that, that could be a little bit hard to swallow, especially if you're used to making the $100 widget. But if you're just getting started in the industry and you've never known what it's like to make a $100 widget, you're in luck. Because making movies these days, in my estimation, is the next small business. Because think about it. You now have the ability to create your own product and source your own audience. And that's no different than you know competing on any street corner on earth with your bricks and mortar business competing with the guy down the street, right? So, how do you compete as a small business? Well, there's several ways. I incorporate internet marketing a lot into this, into this competitive environment because I think it's important. A couple things you need to know when you're uh, creating your content is first and foremost, you have to understand that in business there's something called a unique selling proposition or a USP. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Well, in the movie business, it's pretty much what is your hook? What's your movie about? Because you want to have some sort of distinguishing characteristic that makes your movie or your television show memorable in a conversation. I spoke with a couple of you at lunch, and if I share you know, what I'm about to share, it's, it's not too forgettable. Now, I warn you, this, what I'm about to share with you is inappropriate. It's my first feature film, and I use it as a case study because I have to. We did some things right. My second feature film, which I won't talk about in this discussion, failed miserably because I broke every rule that I'm about to share with you right now. So this was it. We were sitting around and we, we thought, we were like, and when I say we, I've been working with the same people for about a decade, and we were like, we're so sick of making short films. We need to make a feature because as a filmmaker, you're not a real filmmaker until you've at least made a feature film. So the question around that living room on that particular day was, what is the feature, and I've said this before, what is the feature that we can make right now given the resources that we have right now? And we have a friend who's a great writer and he looked up at us and said, I was, I was thinking about a zombie movie. We're like, a zombie movie? He's like, yeah, I was thinking about a zombie movie. And he mumbled it, right? And we're like, okay, yeah, zombie movies, we could probably do that this summer, that, that might be fun. And he said, yeah, but um, I don't know if you guys are really like it. I, it's a little controversial. Um, I'm thinking about a zombie movie where the zombies attack a camp. And we're like, yeah, yeah, attack a camp. OK. No, I, I think they should attack a camp for the mentally challenged. Yeah, I know. That reaction is very typical of what happens when I give this presentation. And I'm a bit embarrassed about it. And in fact, when we made this movie, I thought everybody on Earth would hate me and throw eggs at me everywhere I go. The nice news is we never quite crossed that line. This thing's been out for about six years now. And some folks from the special needs community have actually come back and said that we like it that you empowered the special needs folks within the movie. And in fact, these special needs folks in their, in their own way, shape, and form battled zombies using the abilities that they had, which is, um, you know, I, I'd like to say that we planned that from the start, but we didn't, <laughs> except to say that uh, we did have a good tagline, which was, sometimes heroes ride the short bus. So everybody in this movie is a hero. We also incorporated something that you can't have, or you can't leave out of a zombie movie, which is hot chicks with guns. And if you know the producers, you may as well throw yourself in the movie. I, I was only embarrassed when my mom saw it, but she really liked it. So she's the ultimate test. And my mom liked it. I'm not quite as embarrassed to share it with all of you. But what's the important part of all of this? We had something that was memorable that I could come. None of you are going to forget this. You might hate. I hope you don't hate me, but you might hate that movie. And that's OK. But you either like it or you hate it. I'm going to show you how that plays into your business strategy in a little bit. Now, the next thing you need to do is once you understand what your unique selling proposition is, you have to target your target audience. Well, it's so easy these days. You know, in this particular genre movie, all I had to do was go out and look up zombie blogs, for example. There were 10 million results on Google. 
um, zombie forums, uh, 7 million results. Uh, print publications, quite a few zombie lovers out there. And so what you do in your own particular content, whatever it is, be it the movie or the TV show, you have to figure out, is there an audience that already exists that's ready to consume what it is that I'm about to produce? And if so, how do I reach that target audience? So you do something like this, and then you get a spreadsheet, and you write down 50 to 100 of your top Google results. And you're going to use that spreadsheet later because you're eventually going to reach out to those folks and ask them to help you communicate and market your movie to the masses. Or at least the masses within your niche, or niche as I call it. Um, <laughs> the next thing you got to do is get into, the, I say the video on demand marketplace, but really video on demand and internet, I kind of use them interchangeably. You got to get into the marketplace next. So how do you do that? Well, I mentioned earlier that you no longer need a middleman to access all the coveted places like uh, iTunes and uh, Amazon especially, and some of these other places. I actually work uh, with the company very closely. I'm one of their affiliates, so I get paid to promote them. But that was my choice. I called the CEO and stalked him. Because I was trying to figure out a way to get content on iTunes, and iTunes is still very discriminatory. There's a middleman even without the sales agents and stuff, there's still a middleman called an aggregator. And an aggregator just is, is basically one of these computer companies, one of these tech companies, that helps you get your movie coded the right way and get it into these marketplaces. I found this company called Distriber, uh, run by Adam Chapnick, and what they allow you to do is you pay an upfront fee, they get you in iTunes, and if they don't get you in iTunes, they refund all your money minus $39. This, to me, is a company that's built by filmmakers for filmmakers. If any of you aren't sure exactly whether or not your movie is going to play, one of the things you can do is get it up on the Amazon's Create Space. It's free to get it up there. Uh, they offer you the ability to sell your DVD and sell a video on demand, both streaming and as a rental uh, download. And what it looks like once it's in the marketplace, well, it looks like just like any other movie. If your movie was made, well, ex with the exception of, of course, the, the cover art. Um, if, you're, <laughs> if you're up there and, and you have a movie that, that's made for $200,000 and you're now competing with uh, movies that are made for $200 million, does your target audience, does your intended uh, person within your target audience really know the difference if they're looking for a zombie movie for that particular evening? No. So you got to start thinking about your profit margins from day one as well as these uh, what marketplaces you're going to access. The reason why, by the way, that I emphasize Amazon and iTunes, and I know there's been a lot of talk about some other ways uh, to uh, transmit media today, but the reason why I bring these two up is because my credit card information is stored with both of these companies, not that I want you to go hack it. Uh, but what it means is if I want to go buy something from Amazon right now, I'm only a couple clicks away. And if I want to buy something from iTunes right now, I'm only a couple clicks away. See, what you want to do is remove any sort of obstacles between somebody seeing your movie, liking your movie, wanting to buy your movie, and actually buying it. You don't want them to pull their credit card out of their wallet. It's too much extra work. You might lose them. Number four is in line with what I just described is you want to create your movie sales funnel. Have any of you heard of the concept of a sales funnel? Anybody? Uh, in internet marketing, they oftentimes call this a conversion funnel, and I apply it now to your movie marketing. And the way it works is this. If you can find your targeted uh, audience and you can create some traffic to your website that consists of members from that target audience, your goal is to get as much targeted traffic as you can into the top of your sales funnel so that by the time that they, the, because a lot of people are going to fall off through your sales stages, and the more people you get in the top, the more people come out of the bottom as a purchase. It's pretty simple stuff. And that's why they, it's like a funnel. Just keep dumping people in your funnel. Okay? The way that this looks like on your website is a lot of people that make movies make the mistake of having a really complex website. A website that has press clippings, behind the scenes photos, photo galleries out the kazoo, two or three different trailers, uh, contact us now. So much extra stuff that it might be fine when you're promoting your movie, but when you go to use your website as a sales funnel, you know, it should be very simple. We have, we have our banner at the top, we have a testimonial underneath, we have the trailer, and we have three different ways for somebody to buy. They can rent on demand or buy the DVD now. All of that's available at CreateSpace. We don't touch any of that. And then they have a share button to get into the social media and share it, and an about button. So we wanted to really simplify that. When looking at your, at your movie website, you can tell that you get a lot of traffic coming in from various sources, visiting various pages within your website. 
The thing is, we realized that we were losing a heck of a lot of pages, a uh, heck of a lot of uh, potential buyers, potential audience members on some of these pages. So you cut the fat and just get rid of those pages so you can really focus on what matters, which is pretty obvious, right, by now. Um, the other thing that you do is once you have your simple website is you just want to tweak a couple things and test it. Here we just changed the colors of it a little bit and we kept the buy now button a couple shades brighter and that actually increased the sales by about 15 to 20 percent. Moving forward, um, if they click the about button, which I really don't want them to do, uh, we make it really difficult for them to get back to anything else in the website. <laughs> right? Because we want them to get the heck over to our buy now. The, folks, I, I mean, I, I wish I could make it more complex. It's really kind of, I'm having fun with it because it's simple and it's fun and you don't need a middleman. And we're not done yet. Everybody pay attention. We're going to keep going here. Okay, so let's say that they scroll off the page and they don't buy. We almost lost them in the funnel. So you got to create some way to get them into your social network. So I have installed a little pop-up there that tells them to become our friend on Facebook. So at least if they want to leave, well, maybe we'll capture them, maybe we won't, but if we do capture them, our odds of converting them at a later date and time increases. And for those of you who just think that I'm Mr. Socially Irresponsible Filmmaker all the time, I'm not. Uh, this is a documentary we did, my third feature, about chemical pollution in people's backyard. I felt like I had to do something very socially responsible, of course, to make up for my, for my former movie making. Uh, but the same rules apply. The funnel system is here. So check it out. You have the trailer. You have the name of the movie. You have your buy now right, right down here. If they want to watch it online, they can. They can buy now. And we have the opt-in box as well as the social media buttons over here. So the same principle applies. The one thing that we did do is we got a little bit more sophisticated uh, with this uh, form over here that collects the name and the email. Now, again, this is another one of these companies that I work with and they pay me to promote, uh, audiencelist.com. It, what it is, is it allows you to have that name and email from an internet service provider, which is a third party, which means you're never sending out, and this is very important, you're never sending out commercial communication from your own email address. A lot of people have like the name of my movie at yahoo.com, and they send email out like, hey, come watch my movie. Well, it, A, it's not so professional, and B, when we're talking about trying to actually get your, keep your email out of people's spam folders, going with a third party email delivery company is essential to your success. Uh, this one, for example, uh, forces people to opt in, right? You can't, like they have to do that. Then they get an email that says, are you sure you want to opt in? And then you got to click that link to be super sure that we have the permission. This is called permission-based email. Very important. Um, and, and the reason why I emphasize it so much is, as I'll show you in the end, growing your own fan base is probably the most important. If you forget everything else I say, growing your, mo growing your own fan base is like job number one. You know, re write that down, engrave it into your mind. I don't care what kind of technology comes out. If you can't source your audience, you do not have a business. I'll get to that in a sec, though. You'll hear me repeat that. I'm just so adamant about that. Anyway, so what you want to do is, next thing is, you got to refine your trailer and post it everywhere. I prefer YouTube. YouTube is the second largest um, search engine on earth. It's owned by Google. You get your stuff up on YouTube. And what's great about it is, you can monitor word of mouth about your movie. Uh, there's some brilliant person at the top that said it was the worst movie trailer ever seen. Uh, the person right below agreed. Uh, somebody else was nice enough to say I watched it last week and it was actually pretty fun. I, you know, it's okay if they hate the movie. It's okay if they hate the trailer. What I want is somebody talking about it. What I don't want, and if any of you are creating content, if nobody's talking about your content, guess what? You got to go back and revisit your unique selling proposition because the odds are pretty good. You have to refine your business messaging. Does that make sense? and go back to the basics, your target audience. The other thing that you need to do when you're utilizing YouTube or any of the other um, uh, sites out there is you gotta make sure that you have a call to action on the back of your trailer. By the way, this gives you some idea of how old um, this trailer is because you see where the one call to action goes. It's like one of those old social networks we've never even, we don't even know what that is anymore. Um, 
I'm not going to mention any names. You can see what that is. Okay, step six is increase your targeted web traffic. Now, the trailer is going to help you, and uh, knowing who your target audience is is going to help you. But in addition to that, I mentioned before that you get that list of 100 other websites out there that may be able to help you create communication. What you want to do is reach out to each one of those website owners, which I know may take a little bit of work, and ask them if they would kindly take a look at your trailer. And by the way, would you mind reviewing the movie? Would you like to review the movie? Now, a lot of people say, I'm not sending it to... Bobby and Joe's zombie review website because they're nobody. Well, the truth is on the internet, everybody's somebody. And any backlinks that you can get to your website increases your, so to speak, Google juice and, and promotes um, more traffic, more targeted traffic to your site, which again gets people in your sales funnel, which again increases sales. It all works together. So these are all the, the things that I threw up here just to confuse you. Uh, websites, Press releases, uh, pay-per-click advertising, pay-per-view, uh, pay-per-impression, uh, search engine optimization, newsletters, magazines, ads, blogs, forums, affiliates, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Basically, what you need to do is you've got to go where your target audience is hanging out. Those initial internet searches you do helps you, uh, and finding folks on these social media sites and some of these other places helps you too. The other thing I'll add is I mentioned press releases. In the past, you would not want to send out press releases and you, unless you had something incredibly newsworthy. These days, you can come up with newsworthy stuff, and it's like it's just like one more blip on the whatever, you know. It's just it's one more message that people receive in a day. If you use a press release service um, like PRWeb.com. What's going to happen is your press is released out throughout the internet and it's picked up through something called Real Simple Syndication, RSS feeds, and it's put on other people's blogs and websites. And your internet footprint for a very minimal investment with one press release can grow exponentially over time. As one website grabs it, another website grabs it, another website grabs it, with backlinks coming to your site if you do it right. Uh, what you got to do is you got to monitor your visitor data. On your website, you should include Google Analytics. Google Analytics helps you monitor all the traffic coming into your site. It's a free service offered by Google. Uh, the other thing you want to look at here is you want to see how long people are staying on your site. Now, we noticed that uh, most of the people that visit are staying for at least a minute, which means they're watching the vast majority of the trailer. It's a good thing. Uh, the other thing you want to look at is you want to look at your top traffic sources. We realize that a lot of people are finding us just by typing in the name of the movie, which tells us something vitally important. Our word of mouth marketing is powerful. If people know the name of your movie and they're actually doing searches for it, that means that you're out there, people are talking about it, and they're trying to find you. Top traffic sources, I won't hit on it too hard, but you got to look at where your traffic's coming from. We were so fortunate in that one of the social bookmarking sites, one of the very popular ones, called StumbleUpon.com, caught wind of our movie. Why is that important? Because at StumbleUpon, I can say, hey, I like that movie. Click my StumbleUpon button. And then the 10 other people in my network all say, hey, Jason likes that movie. I'm going to go check out that movie. And then they click their StumbleUpon buttons, and you have exponential growth. Uh, here, that little growth was 108,000 and more people. Pretty good, huh? The cool thing that I discovered was you can actually pay per visit advertising at StumbleUpon.com. Cost about five cents to get somebody to come and view your website. It's not the most targeted. You could find somebody that's into horror movies, for example. You could probably find somebody that's into other genre-specific movies. And what happens is if you pay five cents for somebody to come to your movie and they tell five of your friends, guess what? Your investment wasn't five cents, it was one cent per visit. And if you can start converting some of those people and start crunching the numbers, you may figure out a way to make that very profitable for you. Unfortunately, I thought I'd found the secret ingredient to internet success for everything that I do. And I've tried this with the second movie. I've tried this with other websites that I run. And unfortunately, none of them, none of them encourage word of mouth marketing the way this movie does. So there you go. Uh, stumble upon may or may not work for you. That's the point. You got to build a following for life. Now, I hit on it a bit when I was talking about the opt-in list and the importance of it, but the truth of the matter is when we are talking about these traditional distributors, one of the questions that they can't answer, and, and let me take a step back. In traditional DVD distribution, the sales channels were already all established and well-defined. These days, my website can compete with some of the big uh, studio websites out there, and the important thing for me is for you to know me, like me, and buy the things that I have to sell, right? 
And in order for me to do that is I have to build a relationship with all of you over time. So as a filmmaker, as a TV producer, as a content producer, your goal from this point forward is to work very hard at sourcing your target audience, sourcing the people that know you and know your work. Now, does it always work? Will our folks that, that knew us for the zombie movie, did they like our, our, our uh, romantic comedy indie? Uh, no, <laughs> it was the wrong crowd. But there are people now that are picking up steam that know our writer who wrote the movie, and now he's starting to begin a, uh, to build a following. And of course, I've done it myself with my own filmmaking website where people know me. Folks, this is, you know, regardless of all the technological stuff that you've heard all day, I can't hit on this enough. I know I've said it before, but you must learn how to source your own target audience. And this is where it comes back to that small business analogy. You know, your goal now is to build an audience for your career and eventually leverage that audience to get money. Now, there's a gentleman that I follow, a business guy named Brian Tracy. I've read a lot of his books. And one of the things, and he, when he talks about the definition of business, anybody know what uh, he says is the definition of business? Anybody ever hear of Brian Tracy? It's okay if you haven't. Here comes the drum roll, I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> according to Brian Tracy, the definition of business is to... Uh, find and keep a customer, to create and keep a customer. And your business as content providers is to find and keep your audience. Because now we're competing on this level, right? Where we have to source our own audience. The good news is, is if you can get 100,000 people in your audience list over the course of your career, which is a daunting task, I will admit, but if you can get enough people that know you, know your work and like you, guess what? Now you can go out to a prospective investor and instead of saying, oh, I hope we get into Sundance and get this great acquisition deal and we might be able to return your money. Now you can say, I got 100,000 people who know me and like my work. I sent out an email last night asking who would be interested in my next movie. I did this survey and guess what? 50% of them responded that said that they'd pay in an instant. Do you think that that's just a little bit more powerful than saying, oh, I hope we get into Sundance? Yeah, a little bit, right? You're in charge of your own business. Nobody's going to do this for you anymore. I, I don't believe so. Um, you know, when Vaughn did the introduction for me, he mentioned that, you know, everything that I've done thus far has not included the studios. I'd love to work at the studio level, but I'm not waiting around for somebody to give me permission. And I think that's how we should all think about whatever it is that we do. Like, let me put it in another example. If you wanted to start a yogurt store, would you wait around for, for like some yogurt guy at the top of the hill to give you permission to start your own yogurt store? No. So why would you wait around for anybody to give you permission to start your own mini studio? So there, there's my point. <laughs> the top five questions you need to ask yourself before you go into any production is this. Who is your, and I know this is bad English, okay? But who is your target audience? How large is your target audience? How will you reach your audience? What is your marketing strategies? And how many video on demand, or while DVDs still exist, how many sales, how many unit sales do you need to make in order to break even, and on top of that, make a profit? And if you can answer all of those questions, your business plan is suddenly a little bit more solid than that thing that I keep bringing up, which was the, uh, the, the ever-growing uh, nightmare of the former Sundance dream. Now, uh, go ahead and just ask me any questions. That, that's pretty much the conclusion of my talk, but it's usually at this point people have questions, so hit me. Anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, talk a little bit about crowdfunding. Good question. <laughs> um, a little bit about crowdfunding. You know, I mentioned that company, Distribber, a little while ago um, that helps you get into video on demand uh, marketplaces. Uh, anybody hear the term crowdfunding in here? So a few of you are aware of it. The cool thing about crowdfunding is crowdfunding are sites that are set up. The two most popular right now in the, in the uh, filmmaking space is Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Uh, the difference, and what these sites allow you to do is you go, you go into these sites, you create a profile, and you say, hi, my name is Jason Brubaker. You do a video. Hi, my name is Jason Brubaker. I'm, I'm producing this uh, feature film about zombies, and I'm trying to raise $10,000. And if you... Um, support me, if, if, you, if you support me by giving me $50, I'll send you a copy of the DVD and a t-shirt. If you give me $500, I'll fly you out to the premiere and, and autograph your t-shirt. I, I, you know, I'm trying to give you an idea. So you create these incentives to encourage sponsorship. So there's these big websites, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, where you create a profile and you look for sponsors to come and sponsor you, and in exchange you give them some incentive for sponsorship. 
But the little known secret about crowdfunding that people don't talk about and is so appropriate for businesses is guess what? Crowdfunding, which is so related to social bookmarking and social media, crowdfunding allows you to test your concept before you hit the market. And it's brilliant for that. You already have all these people within the crowdfunding space looking for something that they want to be a part of. I mean, this is becoming very huge. So you have all these people already on like Indiegogo looking for movies that they want to sponsor. And you come up with your movie idea, you make your promotional video, you quickly share it with all of your uh, social networks because they cultivate that and make it very easy. You embed your YouTube trailer. And guess what? You either get a response or you don't. If you complete your campaign, um, you know that you have a good concept that's worth taking to market. If you don't complete your campaign, uh, odds are pretty good that you need to go back, test, refine that unique selling proposition, and figure out what it is that's not working about your particular movie project. Go ahead. How do they get around uh, securities and exchange commission rules regarding uh, uh, soliciting funds for uh, a venture? Well, that's a really good question. I want to be clear. I am not a lawyer, so I'm answering this as a filmmaker with an artistic background, okay? So I'm not qualified to answer that question. So as a filmmaker, I think the way they're getting around it is they're asking for sponsorship, not investors. However, because I read enough of these articles, um, I have heard the rumor in the crowdfunding space that the Securities and Exchange Commission is going to lighten some of the rules to allow crowdfunding sites to go out and actually raise private equity, which, by the way, could be huge. Because a lot of the venture capitalists, um, again, I'm not one of those guys either, but a lot of those folks in this space see crowdfunding as, as one of the next ways Again, to test the concept. See, from a filmmaking perspective, you think, I want to raise $10,000. I want to go out and crowdfund this money. And that's good. But from a real investment business background space, you're like, is this concept even going to work? So uh, that, that's, you know, that's my response there. Go ahead. What's the budget for the uh, The budget is confidential, but I can tell you it's under a million. <laughs> Okay, well, again, it's been a real pleasure speaking in front of you. Uh, feel free to contact me through filmmakingstuff.com, and you can download my free book at freefilmmakingbook.com.